Hey, Rubber Bands listeners. Today, we continue the Matt Angler story. In part one, we tracked Matt's odyssey from breaking and entering to boot camp and onto his marine base in Hawaii, with drug and alcohol addiction following in lockstep. Today, the story continues with drug dealing, prison and rehab, desertion from the Marines, and the long and winding road to finding lasting recovery. Part two of the Matt Angler saga comes your way right now. Welcome to Rubber Bands, an Avenues Recovery podcast. Conversations about the push and pull of addiction and recovery. And now, here's your host, Shlomo Hoffman. So now you started dealing drugs. Now I started dealing. It was just, it seemed kind of like organic to start selling it. I did, it was like the next decision to make. All of a so sudden, the guy's running a cartel. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so now... Now I'm like a successful, I could never be a successful drug dealer in the past because I would just use it all. Right. That's, the, that's the equation. Just get so much that you can't use you can't it all. You can't use it, it's then you around. become a dealer. Yeah, then yeah. you can become a dealer, yeah. right? So you're, run, you're running a real operation here. I mean, you're talking about, uh, I don't know, you're, 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 you're not selling $5 worth of drugs. I'm saying, you're, you're, I'm saying is, there, is there a chain here? There's distributors? There's. Uh... I never met anybody outside the guy I would get it from. I'm saying, were you, were you keeping track of it? Like, were you keeping track of what's going in, what's going out, money? Like, was it like, or was it just uh, like your. Uh. No, not so much, right? right. It, was, it, was, it was far sloppier than right. that, right? Like, it was far sloppier than that. The, I had so much access to the things that this guy wanted. He had so much dope that he was he was giving in trade. I didn't have to keep track of any of it. Right. All of it was just a free for all, and all of it was all of it became very discretionary at that right. point. You know, if I lost an eight ball of heroin, I didn't care at all. Right. You know, because I like I had free access to it. It was at that point, it was all just profit. Right. So now you had a lot of drugs and a lot of money. A lot of drugs, a lot of money. So look, I, I started I started in on the meth. Meth is like super popular in Hawaii. It's a huge, huge down there. Um, so I started in on the meth and not necessarily something that I'd ever done before. Not necessarily something I was ever really, and I'd done it, but never, right. never really cared to do. Right. right? Um, so I can remember thinking like, man, it's, it's, it's so abundant down here. And the heroin, it was starting to get to me a little bit. You know, I was, mm -hmm. I was, I don't know. I, I started overdosing uh, uh, quite a few, you know, quite a bit uh, more than I had ever in the past. When you say you started overdosing, are you like really overdose, like or or yeah, if you overdose, it doesn't mean you die, right? Right. You can overdose and not die, right? Right. Overdoses resulting in death is 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 a component of overdose, is one kind of overdose. But there is also the other kind where like I had hit, been hit with Narcan a few times uh -huh. and. You know, there was, uh, I had some where I just didn't die, right. but I started to get nervous about it. I, don't, I, don't, like I, I hadn't overdosed a lot up until that point in my life, but I never had like the quantities of dope right. that would lend itself to me overdosing a lot either. So right. now I did, and I guess I just didn't know how to act, you know, right. like that was it. I was overindulgent. I'm right. at a, imagine that. So the, so meth, right. I, 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 I started using, and, and the legitimate thought was that, I'm going to start using meth and I'm going to either quit or start using less heroin. It was like my get off of heroin program. Right. Um, and at first it, it was true. <laughs> like I started using more meth and I started right. using less heroin. Uh, at the end of the day, I really liked, I really liked both of them, you know, the, 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 the use in tandem. You like steak and you like ice cream. Right. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Why not participate in both? Yeah. Uh, the meth allowed me to enjoy a little bit more of my heroin high and, and the heroin took enough of the edge off of the meth. Yeah. You know, I guess is the, the deal. But at the end of the day, the, the meth took me to a place that like yeah, I I'd just never been before throughout my use. And I had been some gnarly places, seen some gnarly things. Um, the, the meth got me. I, I felt like my mind was was slipping. I was paranoid all the time. Um, I always talk about it, the, the shadow clan, right? The shadow clan. So I'd be up for days at a time, no sleep, right. very little food, not that like hydrating. Hydrating is like the last thing you, you kind of think of. And um, I guess to the point where I'd, I'd start like hallucinating, like shadows would turn into 
living, breathing, you know, things. And look, and at the time, like this in shape guy leading up to this point, right? Like, right. The, like the typical body type of a, of a Marine and, and man, I'm just losing weight. Like it was every time I got on the scale, it'd be like another five pounds gone. And, and nobody, rid- nobody's seeing, nobody's noticing, no superiors, no, no one knows like what's going on with Matt. So there was there was a couple of people who who like asked, right, mm-hmm. man, you don't look good. And and I would write it off, man, the shoulder surgery is really getting to me. You know, I'd have I'd have right. this. Yeah, like I'm, I'm used to going to the gym a bunch. I'm not able to do it. And like, I know, man, look at me. I'm, I'm losing weight. So the the, the whole time um, I kind of knew like something was going to have to happen. Right. You don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and and sell the, you know all that all that dope use all that dope and Without the and chickens not, coming home to roost right something's gonna have to happen where was all the money so i i would like so the meth right him you're like super paranoid so i like stash it all these places right <laughs> i'd put it in a box up in like a drop ceiling of the barracks or like in the in the wheel well of my car i don't know just the weirdest stuff but you had significant amounts of cash Oh yeah, yeah, significant amount. Um, I, tens of thousands laying around right. is, I think, is a conservative kind of estimate at, at any given time. Now it was all it was all fluid, right? It right. could come in, it could go out. It, it just it just as easily came in and went out at the same time. So there wasn't like right. there was no savings. It was with no savings program. No right. when stuck in a four hundred one k somewhere. It was just it was all there for use and access. It was very fluid. And um, came in, went out just as quickly as the next, right? And it's kind of unsettling to have that much cash. And like, cash is not as useful as as you would think in today's age. It's like really hard to spend cash. Yeah. Like, you're not paying your light bill using cash, right? Like, I I don't, I wouldn't even know where to go pay a light bill at right. the moment. It's just like you pay it out of your checking account because that's what they want. They want right. a debit checking. So the, I would try to get some of it into my checking account and I would go to the, I had that square app, right? I had the square app and I would go to like uh, the, the base exchange. I'd buy those like debit cards, the gift cards, right? For whatever denomination. And then I'd run them through the square app, which would be a deposit into my checking account. That was like as close to money laundering as I would <laughs> what my, my brain could get. You know what I mean? Right. So like the cash was uh, the only, it was only there to spend at that point. But yeah, one day the, the, they did come, you know, CID, NCIS, right? They, they finally came. They finally came. It was a bad, bad feeling. I knew it was coming. I knew it was going to happen. Um, but when it finally did happen, it was as bad as I thought it was going to be. At first I, I like, I freaked out, you know, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I, I can remember they took me into the interrogation room and they sat me there all day. Do you know how they got onto you? I do. Even though it's a contract and even though it's front loaded, you still have to basically execute the funds through a portal. And I don't know how it happened, why it happened. Some people have tried to say over time, like it was, it was intentional. I was leaving a breadcrumb. I wanted to get caught, self-sabotage, blah, blah, blah. I think I just didn't pay the bill. <laughs> this is what it was. I think I legitimately think that, like, I knew I should have done it, and I just didn't do it. I don't know that I had a ton of reasons why. I just chose not to do it. And so as a result of the funds not being executed, basically on the invoice bill pay side, Granger calls asking, well, you know, where, when is this going to be executed? My supply officer at the time says, well, what are you talking about? Uh, we've not been executing hundreds of thousands worth of worth of purchases through you. What's going on? Right. And um, so at that point, there, there, I guess there was an investigation uh, going on for a period of time that I, I don't think I knew about that was kind of happening in the background. And none of the none of the purchased items could be placed throughout the unit. They they mean they couldn't find the bobcat. You know, right. they, couldn't find the, <laughs> they couldn't find the drills. Right? They just they just didn't know where that basement of the laundromat was. Well, yeah, they, they could have they, found they, it. Yeah. It was sitting right there. <laughs> That's it. I mean, it was on a job site. You know, <laughs> it was being used. 
Um, and so that that was it. I mean, it, it, it's not a very um, complex way to get caught. I just I didn't had I paid that bill, I, and I'm I'm like I'm almost a hundred percent on this. Had I paid that bill, I probably I feel like I'd have gotten away with it for wow. sure. I think it would have executed out like any other hundreds of thousands worth of funding uh, military wide. I don't think there'd have been the point of inquiry that kind of kicked off the investigation. I think had I just clicked the button, I, 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 I don't think, I don't think I'd have been caught. That's insane. It is insane. I think yeah. it was, I, I, I mean, really we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. at a time. And, and, and I think it just kind of folds back into at a time when, you know, the country's in a very long war, a very expensive war, there's a ton of stuff going. There's a ton of stuff happening, and I think funding. You know, I, I think it does just get kind of lost in the wash. Lost in the wash. In the laundromat. In the laundromat wash. Right. Three hundred k. It sounds like a lot of money. It does, right. but in in as as relative to a, a, a trillion dollar war, I, I, that's like six bucks. You know what right. I mean? It's relative to. to a trillion dollar war. So you get called in. I get called in. They start to hammer me, like like you've seen in any number of interrogation uh, videos, right? Watch mm-hmm. the first forty eight. Watch any of the the TV shows, and 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 that's, that's exactly, exactly how it goes play. down. And they knew. They knew probably better than me at the time exactly the extent of the crime that I had been committing for sure. Uh, they had it pegged. They knew exactly the deal, and they knew they had caught their guy. And I just, I wasn't talking. I wasn't going to do it. And I, I, I asked for a lawyer a number of times. And um, Does it work like that in the military? Is that the same process? Like you have a right to a lawyer and you have like all that kind of thing? Yeah, all your Miranda stuff right. is, is, is in place for sure. You have the right to refuse the interview. Um, you have the right for counsel. All of that stuff is, is still in place. Um, although I asked for a lawyer like six times when I was in there and, you know, that, that came up, there came a point in like the production phase of the trial where my lawyers were like, why didn't, why didn't he get a lawyer at the first time? Yes. Yeah. Why do you have to ask six times before he got assigned counsel? Uh, it's not up for interpretation. The practical application I think there is a little it's bit different legally. than in civilian life is what you're saying. I don't know. Yeah. I, legally, I don't know that it's different. I just know my experience. I asked for a lawyer a bunch and like the interview continued. Right. But no harm, no foul, right? Like these guys, they were just trying to get a job done. Um, they knew they had their guy. And look, at the end of the day, I was the reason we were in that room. Nobody right. else. Right. right? Like I, I created the scenario where we had to be in that room, why anybody was even being interrogated that day. So I didn't talk. Um, and, I, I, you know, they brought me to the brig that night. Pearl Harbor has a brig on it. Brig is is like military prison, right? right? It's the, the nautical term for military prison. So they, they bring me there that night. And um, so before you go, you got to pack up all your stuff. And it, as as they were packing up my barracks room, you could really see just how how crazy things kind of got. There were there were dozens and dozens of pairs of shoes there was gold chains there was watches everywhere there you were just, living that you were living the lifestyle yeah and but it was just all this stuff right. you know just stuff it had like no value most of the clothes still had the tags on them i don't wear jewelry ever right. never did up until that point haven't since i wear a wedding band that's right. it right and like the the it was just stuff and like i can remember it being put into the storage container and thinking like man this is sick like i know i'm going to jail right now and this is what i'm going to jail for so i could have 10 pairs of the same new balance you know or i can have a gold chain that i'm not so like there was this kind of moment of clarity where i felt really sick about myself i felt really nasty about what i had been doing you know and and so the I can remember I had that same bag of meth that I was in the the interrogation room, uh, still had it. Nobody ever found it. Still had it, and the my possessions were being packed up in the supply warehouse where I worked. That's where they were going to be stored while I was at the brig. Right. So I, I thought there there was maybe a chance I was going to wind up back there one day. So I take this bag of meth and like I go pull a baseboard off of like the bathroom wall and I slide the bag in there and I kind of put the baseboard back and like, okay, I'm going to remember that for later. Right. 
And uh, so I go to the brig. They take me over to the brig and I get checked in. It's late at night. And um, there was this really cool corrections officer. I'm not going to remember a lot of the names, right? Really cool guy. And he's he like levels with me. He, he says, dude, it's about to be really bad. You don't have to tell me what you're doing, you know, uh, but you're about to get real sick, you know? And he, he like, he did what he could to comfort me in, in, in like the receiving part of it, right. you know? So they put me in a cell. And, um, man, I, I, I go through like the worst detox I've, I've ever gone through in my life. You know, it, it's for months, months. I, I've not, I've, I've never gone without dope. You know, I've, right. I've always had plenty enough to use. And so like, this is the first time in a long time that I'm going without. And man, it, it just, it, it felt like it just couldn't get any worse than that moment sitting in there. And, and, and again, I like I, I think I tried to have a moment of clarity. I'm never going to do this again. This is as bad as it will get. You know, uh, this is the bottom. But, you know, all those all those cute things you try to tell yourself when you're in a really bad situation. I, I'm like praying, you know, just help me out. I'll never do this again, blah, blah, blah. So I'm in that cell for a period of time. And I, I finally get moved into kind of like the general population side of the of the the brig where it's, it's just like a big bay, you know, kind of open living in there and a bunch of uh, beds or racks on the floor and pretrial confinement, right? I'm going to be there until my court martial happens. They're, they're continuing the investigation the whole time I'm in there, right? They're continuing the investigation. And I, I, from the report back from my attorneys, they're, they're, they're like having some trouble kind of proving it beyond a reason, beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, there, I guess there was some question of how, how did it really happen? You know, they, they know the property was purchased, but I'm not in possession of the stolen property. So like I, in, in, in the legal world, I guess there was some problems with the case is, is what it boils down to. There was some problems with the case, problems with the prosecution. And so I'm just in there on a pretrial status and I'm kind of going about my day working in the kitchen um, it just not really doing much, just kind of hanging out, I guess is, is the best way to put it. And, um, the whole time I, I'm, I'm using, right. The whole time I'm not using to the, to the same extent that, that I was before I get in, but there was dope in the prison and I was using, I was using when I was in there. So it's not an issue. It wasn't an issue to get dope in the prison. That's interesting to me. If we define an issue as like, can't get it in then then no there was no issue now as far as like the total quantity that could come in i hear you right that there would have been an issue there you know so like had some you, limits there was some limits it wasn't just like free access to the sub right so one day i get a one of the corrections off they call me up to the front they say hey, pack your stuff you're going you're leaving and it, it blew my mind that that i could be getting out of this place i, I kind of thought they were messing with me you know, I, I, I didn't think they were serious. Right. right? But for, what, for whatever reason, for whatever problems with the case that was happening, they could no longer keep me at that level of confinement. They had to release me and, and put me on a base restriction status, meaning I could go back to base. I couldn't leave base. Uh, but that that was that was about as harsh as it could get until they had enough to kind of take me to trial. So that's what they did. And I, I kind of reenter back into the Marine Corps life for all intents and purposes, right? Were they still letting you do your job or no way? No, I was assigned to a job, right? But no longer in the supply shop, no credit card, no, co no contracting. No, yeah, I yeah. was, I the was, credit I, card was, the credit card was taken. It was taken. Daddy right? took away the credit card. I, I can imagine like my sergeant major, like with the biggest pair of scissors you've ever seen, just like <laughs> edge trimmers and cut that thing up. Um, but I was back and I was just doing simple stuff. Like I kind of went back, you know, sweeping and mopping right. and cutting grass, like this, this uh, nonsense stuff to, to keep me busy throughout the day. Still using, right? So still using, still needing a way to, to kind of fund it and, you know, still doing crime. To, to, to support it, although at a lesser level, kind of shoplifting stuff. Um, there was some car theft involved in it. Car theft? Who is, where are you getting cars to sell? So, uh, the street. I mean, anywhere, anywhere you could park your car, I, I, could, I could steal it. It's not like movie car theft. It was right. like a few cars, you know, right. just like a couple. And I'm not trying to 
diminish it, but I'm not trying to oversell it either. Right. There was a few cars in there that I stole and, and I sold. And uh, again, I was I was less than encouraged in the in the, <laughs> the how much money you got for a car. Uh, yeah. I, really, I really expected a lot more. Uh, saying this was this was not going to be a, a, a lucrative. Uh... No, I don't see how anybody makes a lucrative profession out of it. I really don't like the, the, I guess you got to you know, steal a lot of cars, Matt. I guess you got to steal a lot of cars. I guess that's it's a, quant- it's a quantity it's, game. Maybe it is. Maybe yeah. it's quantity or if it is quality, I don't know what quality car to steal. Cause like, yeah. I, I can remember I sold a BMW one time and I got like 1500 bucks for it. Really? Or maybe I was getting, maybe I was getting ripped off. You know, yeah. I don't know. Car thief is complaining about getting ripped off. I like yeah. it. <laughs> 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 and maybe I just didn't know enough to know how to do it. You know, yeah. I, maybe uh, I don't know. So that's how I'm, that's how I'm making it day to day, right? Like just uh, just little shoplifting, little car theft, little little kind of odds and ends crime in order to get enough for that day and just kind of marching marching through life. I always expected there to be an end date to that, right? right. Like I, I really expected they were going to get on with the court martial, that I was going to get sentenced, and like. At that point, what did I have to care for? I'm going to go back to prison at some point anyways. Right. So just kind of run run it into the dirt as best as I can Is is was kind of my approach to life at the time. Didn't really care a whole lot, you know? So um, in that period of time, my, my dad, his addiction, you know, it really progressed to the point where, it, you know, as a result of his meth use, he, he had a stroke. He had like this major stroke, right? And so I get a call, um, you know, my, my family's telling me is if there's any, my dad's dying. If there's any way I can get home, I, I need, I should, I could, I should come home and see him. So like, I go to my command. So to them, I, I think this was, and this is kind of like what my lawyer told me. And he said to them, you know, had I skipped out, they would have just, you know, put a warrant out for me, prosecuted me in, in, in my absence and like hammered me on the sentence and had the marshals pick me up later on, right. you know, and it would have been, wouldn't have been a big deal. It would have been more detrimental to me not to show up to my court martial because it had gotten me on the sentence. Right? right. So they, they set it up. I was supposed to like check in with the recruiting office in the area on a, a daily or every other day, some kind of frequency. And then I could go home, see my dad and tell him to buy it. And then I would come back. Great. So I get a plane ticket and um, I missed the first plane because I'm smoking meth. So, like, this is to go s- tell my dad goodbye. Right. I love you. He's dying. And, like, I missed the first plane because I'm smoking meth. Wow. So I got to get my ch- my ticket changed over, and I do all that stuff and get it for a later flight. And as I'm walking through TSA, I'll go through the body scanner, and they see the pipe and the bag of meth in my pocket, right? So I come out the other side. They stop me, the TSA agent. I'm like, uh, I like try to make a deal with them, say, hey, man, come on, just let me throw it away. Or, you know, uh, look, I got a thousand bucks in my wallet. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you not to not to arrest me. He's not hearing it. I turn to run, and uh, Honolulu PD tackles me at the, the the TSA checkpoint in the airport. I guess the TSA manager comes from like the back of the building. And she kind of like engages me. And um, at the end of the day, they decide I need to be arrested at the checkpoint for the possession of narcotics. There's like this little jail, this little lockup in the back of the airport, right? It had like three cells in it. So they bring me back there. They set me down and they call my unit to come pick Pick me up. Cause like that, that's the ID that I show. Uh, to get to the checkpoint was my military ID. So they know I'm military, right? So they call my unit, come pick me up. And um, my unit grabs me. They bring me back to Pearl Harbor brig for the second time. Back straight to from the, the brig. Back to the brig. So like, it, I keep I, like, I'll think about that every now and again today. Like that, that's crazy to me that my dad is dying and it doesn't matter. The dope is more powerful than that. Right. And like I would choose. And it's also, it's like a no brainer. You're going to get caught if you go through a checkpoint with meth. Right. It's a no brainer. But, uh, you know, I go back to something I said earlier in like, well, yeah, of course I had dope in my pocket. Because that's where it's supposed to be. Because right. that's where it's supposed to be. I do dope. <laughs> you know, like I'm a drug addict. I do drugs. So, like, that is what goes in my pocket. Again, like, none of it makes sense, but it is very real. You know, mm-hmm. like, it, it really does happen that way. So they bring me back to the brig. 
and I'm there, right? I'm there for like a week and, and you get the equivalent of like a bail here. You know, there's no money to exchange hands, but you get the equivalent of a bail here. And they decide, you know, do you need to be kept at this level of, of, of confinement or can you go to another one? And so my lawyers, uh, I had three at the time, and I'm telling them, like, guys, you need to get me out. I'm not doing this again. You need to get me out. And all of them replied back to me and said, no, that we're not getting you out. So I, and, 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 and this is kind of like the cocky part. I can remember looking back at him and saying, guys, like, you're criminal defense attorneys. This I'm is- a criminal. I do crime. You get me out of it. That's the relationship. <laughs> And in my brain, that totally made sense. And like, and one of them, John, do your like, job, damn it. <laughs> yeah, do your job. Like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be the one. You're the lawyer. I shouldn't have to tell you this. And um, so John looks back at me. He said, "No, no, 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 no. You pay us to keep you safe. And the worst place for you to be is out of the jail right now. You are the safest you can be in jail. You're racking up too many more charges, dude. You just got arrested at TSA." for possession of narcotics. Like this is a big deal. And um, I said, fine, we'll see about that. You know, and we'll, let's go to the hearing. So we're in the hearing. And there were a couple of people to go before me and then we come up and they, the, 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 the prosecutor is like presenting why I need to be in, 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 in confinement. So the, the presiding officer, he kind of looks at me, he says, is there anything you would have to say? And before any of my lawyers could say anything, I, I stand up. <laughs> so yes, there is, there is something I would like to say. I am a drug addict and I need help. That's what came out of my mouth. So I was shocked, right? He said, Engler, I completely, be- you know, I completely believe that I'm going to order your commanding officer to get you out of the brig today and send you to treatment. Done. I could not believe he bought it. It, 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 it was another mind blowing kind of thing. Like, I couldn't believe I had just ran the line on him and it was going to work, but it did. He got me out that day. They coordinated. There was no drug treatment on Hawaii that I could go to. So, like, the closest one I could go to was in San Diego, California. So they escorted me from Hawaii to San Diego. Guy from my unit brought me over there on the plane, brings me over there, drops me off at the Point Loma submarine base. It's this Navy base, had this amazing treatment center on it, kind of, you know, spare no expense kind of place. And, and it was specifically for military personnel, this yeah, center? Yeah, specifically yeah. for military. Only military could go there. And there were a ton. There were dozens of, of military people who were there getting treatment for various, you know, for various substances, right? And it was amazing. It was really great. So I get there and uh, I, I go through the detox. I start doing the, the the counseling, the groups, and the individuals, and seeing the the psychiatrists and all this stuff. And I'm like, I feel like, because I was, I was getting value out of. I was, I was getting real help when I was there. I was really getting the help right. that I needed while I was there. Um, I met a lady, right? I met a I met a female maroon, fellow marine, and we we just hit it off, right? And, and, and it's what they talk about, like the rehab romance yeah. kind of thing. You know, um, and dude, it was, it was, you know, the universe put us here together. It was meant to be, this is like super special, right? Like uh, soulmates and all that. Right. So she and I, we started talking about leaving together. And on the day that I finished the program, the night before she left, she went over, um, to the, the airport. She was going to wait for me at the airport. Right. And so on the day that I finished treatment, I was supposed to get back on, a, get on a plane, fly back to Hawaii, you know, go, I think I was going straight to the brig. I think that was the plan. And then I was going to go get court-martialed and right. get sentenced and do my time. So that day I got the most improved patient award, right? So like they gave me this, this award, it was framed. <laughs> I gave a speech. <laughs> I gave this speech about how like the program um, you know, it, it, it worked and, and, and my life was forever changed and you could do it too. guy, like one of those kind of things, you know? Um, so I get it. They bring me to the airport. I meet her there from there. She and I, we like get in a cab, go over to the train station, catch a train from Cien, uh, San Diego to Seattle. And we were gone. So now you're AWOL from the military. So look, this is, this is AWOL would be a nice way to put it. Um, in reality, that's desertion. Right. So it's a time of war. I'm like 
evading charges at the time, evading prosecution at the time. Right. So it's it's kind of a little bit bigger than just a wall. Right. You know, um, I had no intent of coming back and I had no intent of of facing the charges. So it was looked at a lot more harshly. So we get to Seattle and I, uh, I sell a car right from a, um, a car rental place. We take the car and we're gone. You know, we're, we're gone and we're going to do what it is that 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 the kind of life on the run looks like. You know, like living day to day, getting enough to survive that day and and really just bouncing from place to place to place. And, and it, it looked like at first, you know, there's a couple of things need to get a source of income. Right. So shoplifting is, is super quick. Um, need to find a, a connection, which is not really hard to find. You mean like um, a drug you know, connection? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, not really hard to find. Go to a couple of bars, go to right. a, a, a couple of casinos over there. And Once then you know what adventure. you're looking for, you can find it, right? Right. You're going to find it, right? right? Um, and then and start to build up, you know, start to build up some some stockpile and sell and get enough cash to kind of move from place to place. We went to Canada a bunch. It, it, it just I was living a life where, like, I really figured out, like, I was not coming back. That was and it. you had no problem crossing borders and border checks and all that no, kind of stuff. Nothing never, popped up. It's so interesting. Nothing ever popped up. Never once. Which it, it, again, it's kind of one of those unexplainable things to me today. I don't know how that did not happen. Right. Right. I, I really figured. I was going on to military bases all the time. Right. To go get onto the exchange. To it, it's easier to operate on a military base because like there's That's less scrutiny. Knew. Right. Yeah. You can you can abuse it. Right. right. Because you have the ID, you got the uniform, all that stuff. So and nothing was flagged. Nothing was tagged. You walk to the military base to see your ID. They just let you in. They just let me in. That's wild. That was it. There were even and I forget what base it was up there. There was a they had a guy with like this. This it looked like a, a, a cashier checkout scanner gun. Right. Like right. he would scan the magnetic strip on the back of my ID in order to gain entry to the base. I was sweating bullets. They right. like something to pop up. And he said, okay, hey, good. Welcome to base. And, he, and I would just drive on. That's insane. Um, and we were gone for a long time. I don't really, uh, I can't remember the exact time frame we were gone, but it was it was a long, long time we were on the run. And I would I would get like a phone, I would throw it away. Um, it, just to, I always figured I was getting like tracked or something, but right. I don't think any of that was going on. <laughs> I don't think anybody cared about me anymore. And your dad's, and your dad's dying all this time. My dad's dying all this time. Are you in touch with them, or you're not? You're out, you're completely out of touch with your family. Completely too? out of touch. Um, completely out of touch. I think I figured that if they knew where I was, they were going to be contacted at some point. Right. If they knew where I was, they like we'll put them in a tough spot, right? Yeah. So during that time, my brother's a cop, right? My brother's he's a cop in Louisiana. He's awesome. He's like super cop. He's a real cool guy. NCIS SWAT like shows up to his house with his kids inside, surrounds his house looking for me. All right. So like this guy, he's got to put up with that now, you know, he's got to answer his door right. and say, yo, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where my brother is. Right. Like, don't come here. My kids are here. Right. They do the same thing right. over to my mom's house. Cause they thought I might be hiding over there. So like all the while I'm, I'm out here doing what I'm doing and, and like, they're dealing with these consequences of, I'm sure they don't love that when the neighbors are looking across the street, like, why the hell you got, why do you have SWAT teams all over the place? Yeah. Good luck explaining that, at, you know, the Christmas dinner, right? So there there came a point in time where like I, I I I can remember I was like I was starting to feel bad that like my dad's dying. You know, and and uh, it, it, again, it's some of that like intellectual processing stuff. Like I knew what I was doing wasn't okay, right? So I'm talking with the girl I'm running with and, and, and like, I said, man, we really got to go tell my dad goodbye. You know, I, I need to go see him before he dies. I got to go tell him goodbye. So we, we come up with this, this, the plan. This is, it, it is, it's foolproof. It's the best plan. Um, she and I, we're going to take the stolen car. We're going to drive down to um, Louisiana where my dad was going to stop in Vegas to get married on the way. I'm going to drive down, see dad. Hey, dad, love you. Goodbye. Meet your daughter-in-law. And then we were going to continue down to the Florida Keys. And we were going to live out our life happily ever after. Sounds like an amazing plan, man. The plan never got off the ground. This is a plan that like involves getting married, 
telling your dying father goodbye and living half happily ever after somewhere. Mm-hmm. Three like really good reasons to 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 go. And you just never left. That's where the dope was. I was stuck. I could not leave. So we're in this motel. We're in, I don't know, like a Motel 8 or something. I don't know what kind of motel it was. We're in this motel. I guess it's like a seedy part of town. I don't know that. I'm not from there. have no idea. But it is the kind of place where, like, you have to register your car at the at the check-in counter so that you can park it in their parking lot so it doesn't get towed. So I'm checked in under my military ID for, for the discount. And um, I guess I guess the cops make, like, a pass-through of the parking lot running plates I swear to God, I was going to change that plate every day for the for the whole time we were gone, and I just never did it. Car comes up stolen. I guess they check over at the 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 front desk who's in this room. I come up, and so I get I finally do have like a federal desertion warrant attached to my name, right? And like they like kick down the door of the the motel room, like they're going in to get like a high value military target. You know what I mean? Like super tactical, got helmets on and like gloves. They look like they, those boys look like they were ready to go, you know. So they, they, I get arrested. Both of us do. She and I do. We get arrested. I got to tell you, once they put the cuffs on me, th- there was a sense of relief for sure. About a week before, I had gotten sick of the life. Like I, I, I was, I was tired. I was beat up. There was no, there was no Nothing. end game. The only end game was right. was either I get caught and go to prison, or, or I die. You die. Yeah. And I was just beat up. I couldn't, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And, and can I tell you today, like, I am, I don't know that cop's name. But like, I am grateful for that guy. I, I really feel like he saved my life. Now, I think he just happened to be the one rolling through the parking lot, you know, but right. I, I think he saved my life. I for sure believe that. Um, so they arrest me. Um, Pierce County is is the 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 jail that they brought us to. And um, look, county lockups are the worst, right? They they're they're filled with people, and that was December thirty first, two thousand twelve. So it's New Year's Eve, right? <laughs> New Year's Eve, I get arrested, and like the wor- I think the worst time to get arrested is on a holiday because like there's no bail hearings, there's no nothing. You're just stuck till everybody gets back from holiday, right? That you're, you're just in there. Nothing's nothing's being processed. So I, I, I go in and um, I get up to the tier and there's there's a ton of people on the tier. It's grimy. And I, um, I, I get up into the into the to the rack and, and I kind of set in like I know the detox is about to start happening. I know like, I'm start to starting to pay the price. Right. I'm starting to have have like the consequences right. I've been running from. And um, dude, I just started re- kind of replaying like everything that that i uh i've been going through so like i call my mom you know i give mom a phone call and uh it's like one of the scariest phone calls i've ever had you know when i heard my mom's voice that night and me and my mom are close you know and and i love her and i know she loves me and we got a good relationship when i called and she heard my voice just like you could tell she was just happy i was alive mm-hmm. and 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 you know, I, I'm I'm a parent now as of like the past couple of years. So I really didn't know what she was going through. But now I have like a little bit of insight. I couldn't imagine thinking one of my two boys is living a life that they're going to that is probably going to kill. Them. Couldn't imagine being in a place where like a good day is to hear that they're locked up. Like that's a good day. Right. I, I, I uh, it. She really conveyed that just in the tone of her voice. And, and like the words were simple, you know, I'm so happy to hear you're alive is what she told me. And, and like, you could tell she really meant it. Like it was like this very real, I'm just happy to hear you're alive. And and I, I'll just never forget it. It was a, a, probably the most devastating time period you could put somebody through. Right. Like, and, and, um, and then she told me just after that, you know, your dad's dead. You missed, you missed the treat. You missed the, you missed the goodbye. I didn't even just miss it. I had a chance. Like I decided not to go. <laughs> like through my use, there was a lot of things that like I was okay with. I was okay with being a drug addict. You know, I, I knew that from a young age. Like I didn't, I didn't, 
I knew it wasn't okay. I knew I, I, I didn't want to be, but I was. And like, I accepted that. I knew the consequence of committing crime. Like I could go to jail and like, but I still did the crime. So like I accepted it. I never knew that all those years later, I would make some choices to like, not go tell my dying father goodbye or like, thanks, or I love you. I just never knew that was going to be a consequence. I, um, it was really, it was the worst thing I've ever done is to not go, not go see him. Um, didn't go to the service, <laughs> didn't go to the funeral, didn't even know where it was. This guy, he wound up getting buried in an unmarked grave. In a graveyard, I had no idea where it was. So, like, all of that, you know, over the years, I've, I've, I've come to understand it was something I felt a lot of guilt over, a lot of remorse about, and that's fine, right? I should. I, I believe that I should, you know? I, I, don't, I don't think that that guilt or shame or remorse should like prevent me from going out and living my life. Right. And, and being healthy and, and, and all of that. But, um, it's fine that I feel bad about what I did, you know, cause it was a bad thing that I did. Right. So over the years, what I've, what I've come to understand is, you know, every time I kind of talk about that part of my life, you know, I start to use that really negative thing, that really terrible thing that I did for something positive. Right. And that, that then that's something that kind of recovery taught me. You know, it's it's a way of, of sharing with somebody else. Well, here's where I've been too. Here are the things that I've done. I accept you for what you've done, and like together we can we can live a better life as a result. Right? Nothing will alienate us from being able to recover. Even so, something even something so terrible as like not going to tell your dad goodbye. Right? Okay. Um. So that's it. That's that's how I found out, um, you know, dad passed. And um, so I'm in Pierce County and I'm going I'm going through the detox in jail again. Right. I'm locked up again. Uh, this time I know I'm done and I'm not getting out. So they said they call them Marine Corps chasers. They're like uh, military police who kind of escort criminals, military criminals across the country when they have to be to their various things. So they send them from Hawaii to Washington. They pick me up. We fly back to Hawaii. I go back to Pearl Harbor Brig for the third time. My legal team is like, dude, you done? So it's going to be it? Like, are you fi- have you finally had enough that you're just going to stop? We need you to stop getting charges. We need you to stop messing this up because like you're already looking at a ton of time and um i said yeah fine i'll do just tell me what i need to do are you done using at this point you're still using i'm done using at this point um and look as a as a side note december 31st 2012 is still my sobriety date today and december 31st was the day of that phone call to your mom yes that was the day i got arrested um day of the phone call to my mom day I found out my dad died it's crazy that the best and worst day of my life are like the same day yeah. <laughs> you know because that convert was- the conversions of that yeah and they're they're so tightly related I mean, right it's, it's really really can't have one without the other right I needed I needed that day to be as bad as it was so that my life could turn around I would say I would say that's a fine way of saying goodbye to your dad I um it's definitely wrapped up in, you know, the, that day for me. Um, and look, there are a lot of reasons that I'm sober today, you know, but the kind of like the in memoriam thing for him, right? It, it's, it's, it, it's, it's real. It, it's real. It's definitely a, an important piece of it for sure. Um, so I agree. I agree. My legal team, right. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, on team law now what is it that you need me to do i'm listening um you, you can direct me and I'm, I'm i'm like just blindly signing my name on papers at this at this point whatever you're like in the dmv right, right now. Like... or you're like your your <laughs> iphone consent right like yeah. Whatever. Just, yeah that's fine I, so i'm look i'm 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 going with whatever they say they they start working back with the prosecutor 
look, there's still problems with the prosecution's case. Like those, they didn't go away. They were they they still had some significant problems, um, but now they had some leverage. Uh, there was there was those. Well, now you have a desertion charge too, right? So you right, got that, right? and the, that's the leverage. They have some other charges that they start saying, "Hey, look, we're just going to charge him out of the wazoo on all this stuff." And you know, if some stick and some don't, we'll still get the time. So, like, right. they made a com- compelling um, kind of presentation of of a plea deal. Uh, the the plea deal was it was five years, um, five five years, and like. You know, at the time, I'm kind of sick. I was kind of shocked. Right? We had gone from ten to five, and I said, "Man, you know, five years that 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 sounds like a long time, but not an incredibly long time." In the time since, like, I've uh, you know, I've talked to my brother. I've been connected to a drug court here or there that I've been working with, and and uh, they they know what what I was convicted of and how much time I did. And they were like, "Dude, out here, you would have never gotten five years." You'd have gotten like six months of probation. <laughs> you probably would never would have even seen a jail, you know? And it, it, it so apparently I got hammered. I don't know. Apparently I got hammered on the time. And um, but I accepted it. I accepted the plea deal and um I I, I, I pled to I pled to all the charges, right? The in a weird way, pleading to all the charges was kind of like cathartic. Like finally sitting down and just spilling it, you know, just in a very formal way, spilling it out. This is, there's no more hiding any of this stuff. I'm just going to tell you the worst parts about me. You have to accept them. You're a court. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, like there's, there's, there is going to be a judgment period at the end of it. But even that I was okay. With. If it felt like there was, um, I was like being given an opportunity to like pay Every- for what I had done. And start again. Start again, right? Like get square back with my life, and and uh, there was a part of me that kind of liked it. You know, it was it was kind of a relief again. I was it, it was a relief. So I pled out the the judge wound up giving. I think he gave me eight and a half years. So you know, three and a half suspended past the five on the plea deal. Got it. Um, and. Look, it was like this two-day plea session with with the sentencing, and I can remember at the end of the second day, I got back to to the brig, and I just collapsed. Like I was, I was done. I was overwhelmed. I was emotionally overwhelmed. I was tired. You know, it, it felt like I had just gotten rid of all the the stuff that had been ruining my life for such a long time, and and. I just slept. I just slept. That's all I could do was sleep, right? It wore me out. You found peace. I think that's what it was. It was like something I hadn't experienced in a long time, just like a truly clean conscience. Like an unaffected, dreamless sleep. Just sleep. Man. I, um, and so like, even today, and I don't want this to be too poetic. I'm not a super poetic guy, right? But like, I, I try for that like every day now. I try to live that kind of way. Uh, so I get transferred over to Miramar, um, California. It's it's a Marine Corps base. And uh, at just kind of like a funny side note, if you've ever seen Top Gun, that's where Top Gun was filmed, right? Oh, so in, that, in that actual facility. In, in, in that, that actual yeah. facility, right? Like yeah. that's like the... I don't know, the fighter jet ace mecca uh, of the world, or at least it was when Top Gun. I don't know if it still is, but at least it was during the filming of Top Gun. So I get there and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like white knuckling the, the sobriety thing, just doing the best, like on kind of like self-will, you know, I think would right. be the, the best way to put it. And um, I, I kind of like a tormented time there. You, I don't know how to live without dope in my system. I'm trying you know, I'm trying to do all the stuff, and I'm, uh, but I don't know how to do it. And so I'm messing it up. And, you know, the the in prison around a bunch of other cons is right. is like a volatile situation. There's a fight that I, I guess I've participated in it, right? And, you know, I didn't think you could really get any worse than being in prison, right? Like prison's like the kind of the worst place you can be and still be alive. Well, until, in, in, until you find yourself like in the prison inside the prison which is disciplinary segregation, right? And so, like, prison can get worse. 
as bad as it may be, like there's a worse portion of it. You always, yo, Matt, you always found the back rooms, you know, you found the back room in the, in the airport that no one knows about, you found the back room in the prison, you always found the rooms that nobody knows about and nobody yeah. wants to go to. Yeah. I have a talent for messing up my life. I'm, yeah. I'm very, very good. I'm the best at messing up my life. And then you're right. I always do find the worst possible place that I can be in. And, and, and that's where I wound up. And so I'm in this room. And, uh, you know, I'm on there 23 hours a day. I'm kind of locked down. I can't leave. And um, um, I got nothing in there, right? Like, even if I needed, like, toilet paper, I had to, like, call the guard to bring me up some toilet paper. Couldn't have it in myself. So I could have a T-shirt, pair of shorts, pair of socks, some, some flip-flops, and a religious book, piece of religious literature, Right. So the the chaplain he's bringing me he's bringing me this literature, you know, and 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 I'm reading it. And I love it. I'm reading the Bible. I'm reading the Quran. The reading was something that like became really important to me when I was when I was locked up. And those those books I had like been introduced to them before. You know, I'd grown up. I'd gone to Catholic school, so I like kind of knew about it, but I never like actually sat down and read them. And I loved them, but they were still kind of like almost out of touch for me where I was at the time. You know, I, I don't feel like I was in a place where like I could accept, you know, that kind of intense, you know, spiritual kind of journey. Right. Like I, I it you, got you really needed like a practical thing to sink your hooks into. I needed a practical thing. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, this chaplain comes up to me and he pulls out this AA book and he said, man, you know, 20 some odd years ago, this really helped me. Maybe check it out slid it to me. I had seen it before. I'd heard about it before. Um, but I sat and read it and like, finally something made sense. I had those problems. <laughs> <laughs> I had those problems, you know, I had those consequences. I was like living what, what, what was written there. And, and instantly I could connect. And that became your Bible it, for a long time. Yeah, it did. And now and I've learned since, like it does not replace the Bible, right? right. It, it, it at all. And the Bible has grown in, um, and, and really the Bible, Torah, any of those books, they've grown in value to me because I, like, I, I'm in a place where I can understand them better, right? And connect but, but them. At, that, at that point, that's what you needed. Yes, hundred percent. That was, that was your gateway. That was it. It opened. It opened my eyes. So you really became you became sober on an emotional, like on a sort of an emotional rush you know, that crazy kind of day that sort of like just, you know, blocked use from your brain. Like it wasn't an option anymore, but I kind of feel like just from hearing your story that what sort of kept it, you know, after the, you know, emotional rushes wane, you know, they, they sort of like float away. If you don't make, you, you have the opportunity to con concretize it, that, you know, by finding the book, by finding AA and sort of keep that going. hundred percent. And, and, and even today, I still believe it. The book was like my, my introduction to it, my introduction to how to continue to live life sober and filled with principle. And so I, I go in front of this discipline board about getting out and they asked me what it was that I was going to do different. If they let me out of disciplinary seg segregation, what was I going to do different now? And I said, well, I am going to start trying to get sober, right? Start trying to get sober. Go to I'll go to AA and it's interesting that you were that you weren't using and you still didn't consider yourself sober yet. I, I consider I was abstinent at that time. Right. That was it. I was just abstinent, and so I can remember the the uh, the discipline board. They responded back to me by saying, "Okay, so I understand you'll go to you'll go to AA, but like we want you to go to treatment too." So they had a treatment program in the in the in the Brit, and and so I agreed to go. I got in there. It was very much so different from the last time I had gone to treatment. Do you feel that it was better or you just feel that you were ready? Yeah, I think it's both, right? I think it's both. I think my readiness made it better. And I think they capitalized on that as well. You know, I, I could yeah. finally just shut up for a second and start listening, um, which was a big I guess that's why that's why like humility is so important, right, in recovery. I had no idea that we were even talking about humility at that time. Right. It, it, that, 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 was a, that was a list. <laughs> that was a word on the list that I made. I knew nothing about it. 
I, and I can remember, I'm in this, I'm in this AA meeting. There was like seven of them a night. A lot of them were like TNC or H and I. So they would like bring in the speakers from outside who were coming to do service work so that they could stay sober. And um, this guy, he'd come in, he had done some time. He had shared that with everybody. I liked him as a result of it because, you know, I could connect with him. I'm, I'm doing time. You did time. Like, like we're best friends. Right. And so I start to, uh, you know, I hadn't even I started to talk, but I, I hadn't even said anything up until this point. He just looked at me with this look that like went right through me. And he very directly told me, he's like, I look like a guy who needed to just shut up. And like, it, it got me, you know, like this guy, he doesn't know me, but he really knew me at the same time. Like we've never been introduced, never shook hands, didn't even tell my name. And like, he knew enough to look at me and tell me, you need to shut up. So that, that treatment program, they really capitalized on that when I was there. Um, not a lot of it was like groundbreaking stuff. You know, it wasn't so complex that I needed that I needed a degree to participate in. The experience I had as an addict was was enough to allow me to understand. You went to school for a lot of years. I did. <laughs> you had that degree. <laughs> yeah, I got a double doctorate at this point, I guess. <laughs> um, so, but at its simplest thing, what they were helping me do was move from day to day, not with not making a huge amount of progress to the guy I wanted to be, but that I was at least marking any regress from the guy I wanted to be. And so they, they were just helping me daily be the guy that, that be the best guy. That, that has a shot at being that guy one day. That's it. Right. They were not looking to make me into like the king of the moon, you know, or the president right. of, of Mars. Right. They were just, it was ve a very realistic approach. They would tell you, we're just trying to get you some time. That's it. We know if we get you enough time, you will start to progress as a result of the time. I started not making life worse for me, which was which was better than I had ever done before. <laughs> you know, I was I was always in the game of making my life that much worse. And I stopped making it worse. I, I wasn't improving it a ton, but I stopped making it any worse and I could deal with that. And then I saw my life, it started to come together. I I look, I did get a sponsor. I did start working the steps. I did go to AA. I did participate in treatment. I started doing all the things the people around me told me to do. In there, I, I, you know, I got, I started going back to school. I, I, I started getting interested in working in addiction treatment. Um, went to school to be a counselor for, enrolled in, in college. Which, like, I wasn't a college guy. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I was going to do that. But I, I went back. And I was really good at it. Like, I made all A's. You know, and which was, and I cared about it. And it was interesting to me what Plato talked about a million years ago, and which I would have never cared about that before. Um, I would read five and six books at a time. Like, I just, I couldn't stop. Like, just the gathering of knowledge or the experience through a, through a novel or whatever it was, I started to find enjoyment in that part of life, which, which again, was not something I ever cared about. So I started, I say all that to say, I started caring about life, you know, started being alive. That was it. Yes. You started living in prison, <laughs> you know, like in prison, got the opportunity to do that three times a day, whole cell block lines up to go, to go to chow. And there is this thing that happens when you're in line with a bunch of prisoners merely by the fact that you were ahead of me is telling me that you're disrespecting me right well so there was one day that i just found myself at the back i was the last guy in line and i was so happy to just be at that spot i didn't need to be the next guy i didn't need to be the first guy i was just happy being the last person in line and all the pressure was relieved and there was there was nothing that said I needed to get involved in the game because it's not about being respected or disrespected. I'm just standing here going to get something to eat, right? And like finally I was okay with wherever I was. You found your spot in line. And that was fine. Like it was it was huge to me to finally just be okay. 
even though I was at the worst spot, I was finally just okay. So yeah, I, I look, I get a job. I'm working in the wood shop in there. I, I, I learned how to weld in there. I got to like, uh, got certified to be a welder. I don't care about woodworking. I don't care about welding ever in my life coming up to now, but I, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed welding. I enjoyed woodworking, you know, building tables and chairs or whatever. It was fun. You know, it was, it was interests that I didn't even know I had. I started to be open to, and all of that was allowed because of the, the work that was done at actually being sober, not just abstinent, actually being sober. And you spent, and you spent five years there, the full five? I wound up spending three. So I applied for a parole the first time. I'm doing all this thing. I got a pretty good parole packet the first time I, I, I present and I get denied. And it crushed me. You know, it crushed me. Traditionally speaking, that kind of letdown would have resulted in a relapse. Something really, really terrible, right? This time it didn't. I just felt it, got through it, and went on about my life. You know, so like, for, I, I was really disappointed, and I just, I just, it, 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 the sobriety piece carried me through that, right? So the second time I'm up for parole, a year later, and um, and I'm talking, I'm talking with my sponsor in there, I'm talking with a couple of guys that I piled around with, and and I'm telling them like, God, I'm not. I'm not even applying, you know, I'm not going to do it. And uh, I don't want to get let down again. I'm going to just do my time and I'm going to get out. That's fine. I'd rather deal with that than the letdown of, of getting denied for parole again. So I'm going to just do my time. So at that same time, I had started talking with a, with, with a guy who was sober, worked in a treatment center. He was the CEO of a treatment center. And um, he and I, we started up like this phone conversation. He meets my mother through um, a, a substance abuse ministry, a substance addiction ministry she's part of at the time. And it turns out like he's friends with my brother, or at least knows my brother. They went to high school together. He's running a treatment center at the time. And um, so we start talking, right? We start phone, writing letters, the pen pal kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm going up for parole. I'm kind of sharing with him my thoughts on it. And he, he says, well, dude, is there anything I can do? Look, I'm, I'm, uh, he's been sober for some time. He's just kind of doing, you know, is, is kind of his own outreach. Is there anything I can do? And I tell him, yeah, uh, give me a job. dude. <laughs> give me a job at your treatment facility. I don't care what it is. I'll go sweep the parking lot every day. Whatever you got, give me a job. He said, okay, let me look what I can do. So he did. He, he, he offered me a, a tech job, a behavioral health tech job at the, in the program. So I put that together with my parole packet. I send it up and um, it got approved. It got approved. And my, my case manager at the time, he comes back and he says, uh, you know, that job is what's getting you out of here, right? So he kind of gave me some insight and it was kind of prophetic, right? Like it was, it was, it was, I felt like I was going where I needed to be, you know? And I felt like, People who were sober reached out to help me get where I needed to be. It's almost like a chain, Matt, you know, the, 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 the sobriety chain. Yeah. From one person to the next person to the next person. Now you're doing it, you know, you're, you're giving, you're making new links on that chain. It keeps getting, I guess with every link, it gets stronger. So I've, I've come to find out there's three places I feel completely comfortable, right? Completely. And they all kind of have the same reasoning behind them too. Right. One's one's a prison cell block. I feel comfortable there. Right. I can walk in. I feel comfortable. I'm all right. You know, um, the next is. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Well, once I get to it, it makes a lot more sense. It's not okay. as dark. As long as the door is not locked. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So the, the second one is an AA meeting. Right. And then the third one is a treatment center. Those are the three places I feel completely comfortable. And here's why. I already know I got something in common with everybody in there. I already know kind of like the most difficult thing there is to know about you or me. So anyways, I, I get out um, Halloween 2015. I, I come home. I, I'm going to go live with my grandfather. That's where I got proved to go parole at. And um, November 4th, 2015, I start working in um in the in the treatment center and i was completely freaked out at first i just walked there was like 
there was a bunch of people walking around talking about their feelings. And I, you know, I, I relate with that. And it was like all this treatment center talk, you know, right. that, that there was a little bit of in prison, but not in the same way, not as like vulnerable as there was, as there was here. Kind of has like a different, a different twist a treatment different twist. center in prison than regular treatment center. Right. It does. What I'm hearing. Like, yeah. There's still some reservation in prison, right? Like you, you don't want to still got to be a man. You still got to be a hard ass. You still got to be a right. You don't want to get used up because you became too vulnerable and you shared right. just a little bit too much. There's some stuff you got to keep to yourself. Right. And like right. you don't want somebody to get you as a result of it. So, I, you know, I worked my way over to really understanding what was going on here. And I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated that places like this existed for people like me. And then I saw how much people were getting out of it, that it was actually people getting help to save their own life, right? It, 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 it meant so much to me, the work that we were doing um, for the people we were doing it with. My brother says it all the time. I arrest a ton of drug addicts who do crime. I arrest very few criminals who do drugs. So like it, it, the crime is born out of the addiction. Right. Like the only reason it's happening is because the addiction is there. It drives him nuts. Like he, he really feels there's got to be a better way to do this, you know. But I mean, he's, he does what he has to do. You know, there's nothing right. he can do about it. But, you know, over here, I can see that we are doing the thing that will actually help. Right. That that we're going after the addiction that kind of creates the opportunity for everything else. Like I've right. lived that. Right. So I, I'm in here I, and I'm, I just want to learn. I just want to learn. And at first, like, I'm, I'm totally OK with with spending every day of the rest of my life as as a tech um, I, today, even today. It's such a great job. There is so much help to be had in it and so much help to be given through it. Like, I, I love it. I'll say this. I've worked a ton of jobs in, in, in treatment. And it's up until this point, it's been my favorite one. I had so much fun being a tech. It was it was a blast, right? Matt, what's what's your what's your family meant to you in this whole process? You found that you have a wife, you have children. So I I, I met my wife at work. Um, so she tells me um, we we obviously hit it off like day one. You know, we 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 run into each other. There was some obvious attraction kind of stuff happening. And then she tells me her last name and her last name is, is like a rare last name or not common. And I said, oh, wow, I was friends with a guy with that last name when I was young. I was like, where are you from? She said, Destrahan. And I said, oh, my God, I'm from Destrahan. This has to be your brother. It turns out it was a, her brother. And I can remember from when we were younger, you know, but now like when there's like a six year difference between us. So like when you're 12, that makes that people care about that. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's a big deal. Yeah, it's yeah. Six to 12. That's big. Right. But now we're older and it doesn't matter so much anymore, right? Um, and so we hit it off. And most amazing relationship. She's sober too. Um, we've really built a life together, right? Um, it's the most honest, the most, uh, the best relationship I think, I think anybody could ask for. We really get each other. We work together. Um, we're partners in, in the thing. And, you know, so we're married. We got two kids. Um, they're amazing. You know, one's two, one's five months and they, you know, I feel like I'm living the life today that like was only meant for other people. It didn't ever seem like it was in the cards for me. I always wanted to be somebody's husband. I always wanted to be somebody's dad. I always loved the thought of that, but never thought I could get there. That's for other people. That life is too special for me to have. But like, that's not true. It's not true. That life, like, I deserve that life. You know, like, I, I really do. It, 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 and I'm grateful for it. I don't take it for granted. Um, every moment that I get to spend with my family, I do. My mother, um, who's probably the person still alive that most hurt by my addiction, um, she and I have mended. You know, um, and I say this when she's having a difficult day, she calls me, you know, she asks for my opinion on stuff, which like even to, it's like crazy sometimes to, to think that this is like the most put together person I know, most successful person I know. And like when she's struggling with something, she'll call me about it. It's unbelievable. My brother, 
um, again, super cop. And the, the, the guy is, is, I can't say enough about him. And he's let me back into his life. You know, when I got out, he had a child. He asked me to be that child's godfather, which is huge, right? Um, uh, we're all really close, you know? And we spend a lot of time together. We enjoy each other. And I'm honest back with all of them, which was not something I could ever be before. I had too much to hide. So, like, now I don't have anything to hide. Like I said earlier, like I still do some stuff that I don't, you know, that's not okay because I'm human and I have faults, but like even that is not worth hiding, right. you know, like even in that I, I get the opportunity to be honest about it and, and I do that. So even though I mess up, like, you know, I messed up. Okay. And, and, and uh, I apologize for that. I'll try not to do that again. Um, but all of those people, you know, I'm completely transparent with, and, and that is huge for all of us, I think. Matt, your story is incredible. It was incredible the first time I heard it. It's incredible again. Um, thank you for sharing it again. Thank you for sharing with our listeners. I'm giving you the chance to say one final message after three and a half hours of nonstop yapping. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding around. What would, you, what, what would you say? Give me your elevator speech to anybody that might listen to this that might you know, even sort of find a way back because of this story. It's never too late. You can be and deserve to be and are loved. There are people out there who get it and want you as part of their life. There's always something else we can do to make a difference. And there are people out there who are willing to do that something else. It's not a lost cause. Come and get the life that you deserve. And that's a wrap. Thank you, Matt, for coming on and sharing your story. This has been another episode of Rubber Bands, conversations about the push and pull of addiction. 